I'm Pauline Elliott, and I'm a geologist at the Bureau of Mines and Geology here, and I organize these seminars, I think. Um, and today uh, we have, I think, a very special speaker who uh, is very well known uh, in, amongst research geologists. He's known for economic geology research. Um, and I, I will admit, as not an economic geologist, I had not heard of you until I came here and I went to, um, uh, they, they, said they gave me money to buy field equipment. And the first thing I got was something called a Brimhall mapper, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. It's a clipboard with a plexiglass front, so that you can put your map in there and see it when the clipboard is closed. I mean, genius, <laughs> genius. <laughs> anyway, uh, George Brimhall is, uh, you're retired? Yep. Yeah, he's retired from UC Berkeley, um, but he's had a... Uh, a long uh, history. Uh, he had a professorship at Johns Hopkins uh, and UC Berkeley. Before that, he was employed by the Anaconda Company, so here in Butte. Uh, so he knows the area very well. He was the steward mine geologist, a project geologist for exploration uh, of the deep porphyry, copper, molybdenum, and mineralization. Um, he has received the Lindgren Award for the Society of Economic Geology for his research on the uh, ore bodies. Uh, he uh, served as chair of the NSF panel for the Division of Undergraduate Education course, curriculum, and laboratory improvement program. He served on the California State Science Advisory Panel of the Commission on Future Credentialing. Um, he's very active in uh, general education, trying to, uh, with education, science education, and the public schools, and, and just generally sharing his novel knowledge with everybody. He, uh, he, he lives in Wise River and gets free classes of geology to anybody who would like to take them. So think about that. Um, and I think with that, I will give the stage to George Grimhall. Thank you, Colleen. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> Uh, Montana Tech and Butte have always been special to me, and uh, uh, I'm thrilled to be invited here by Colleen to give this talk today, and she only gave me three weeks' time <laughs> to do this, so this is what I've been working on for the last few weeks, so happy that you, you chose to come to it. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is science, engineering, and society, a very broad topic, uh, from three different perspectives. One is from civic engagement, the kind of thing I do out in Wise River, uh, you know, trying to help people interested in, in geology learn more because Montana is the best field laboratory in the United States that I know of. I'll look at a bit of perspective from higher education and end with a little bit from a perspective on earth resources and try to weave those three things together. A uh, few acknowledgments here. Uh, Alton Miller is my colleague in the Wise River uh, a uh, program we call Earth Book Montana, like a geological map is an earth book. Uh, she, she does very helpful uh, uh, collegial work with me. Ed Rogers is a former colleague at UC Berkeley with me. He was a former director of assistive technology. He's helped me transform the way I think about things in terms of universal design, actually teaching in such a way that everybody has access uh, to, to what, what we have to say. And then finally, my wife here, who's sort of my muse for life, uh, always uh, stressing including people in humanities and social sciences and uh, really showing people why what we do is important and learning from them as well. Uh, with that said, uh, I think science has been the lodestar of US national policy for a long time. Uh, one obvious milestone in that is when President Lincoln in 1863 established the National Academy of Sciences to get people together who could help uh, his military design a compass that would work on the monitor, an ironclad warship. And a compass doesn't do well when you surround it with, with mild iron. And so they had to figure out how to do that. And from then on, uh, that academy was a place where they collected people that uh, uh, were happy to help out for free and without prejudice uh, or gain. And 
about 100 years later, the Academy of Engineering was uh, established for the same purpose, and then finally the Academy of Medicine. And it, 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 it's just an example of how our government acknowledges the use of science, engineering, and medicine in service of society at large. And a question that I'm going to motivate this first part of this talk with is how all of us in science and engineering uh, bridge a gap with society by using knowledge and service of society and communicating results uh, effectively. And I don't think we do a very good job of that sometimes. We get sort of in our own silo and love what we do and whatever products are come out of that or we teach. And, but what we don't do is talk to the general public. And I think that hasn't served us well in the long run. Uh, a good place to start is to really try to identify really big, important bodies of knowledge and uh, 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 to find a pathway to, to guide interested people at a comfortable pace for them, uh, reinforce ideas with iteration and examples. And uh, I've discovered by doing experiments on this, uh, you find people that are really uh, great uh, associates. They really want to learn our sciences and the engineering related to it. And the ultimate goal is to broaden their reference frame to include perspectives based in science and engineering rather than try to replace their frame of reference. You know, uh, nobody's successful doing that, but if you can just broaden the bandwidth of it to include some other perspectives, all of a sudden the conversation changes. And I think this country can use a lot more of that right now. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little bit of history for me, because whatever perspective I share or anybody would share, it's based on where we came from. And I'll give an example of how important Butte was in my life. I was a steward mine geologist from 1972 to 1974, and that was, that was a remarkable job. The mine superintendent I worked for was Bob Cox. And he was known to be the best mine superintendent in all of Butte. He'd come from the Anselmo, which was an amazing zinc producer, to run uh, what became the most productive underground copper mine. And uh, for example, the Brunton Compass that the geologists here know is our, uh, our main tool was field tested in Butte in 1890. Standardized mine mapping was invented by my predecessors in that department. And the, the big idea was you separate interpretation uh, from, uh, from observation. That it, it, this 10 people mapping the same thing should have the same data shown. How they interpret that is something else. But the facts should be separated from, from the interpretation. Uh, notice the steward mine stopped in 1976. And uh, uh, I had done my doctoral research on the, the deep low grade ore body. These are the butte veins here. This is a subsurface volume of copper uh, uh, molybdenum mineralization. These are porphyry dikes. This end had been upthrown. That's where the East Continental Pit is now. And uh, this was a really exciting place to work in those days. And uh, I became project geologist for exploring that. Uh, and that was a wonderful time of my life. And, and it really set a lot of my perspectives that I have today in motion. And the team we had was uh, Bob Cox as head engineer. Bob Mudry, who had been a mine uh, uh, boss, George Burns, who was uh, probably the geologist that knew more about Butte than anybody else I've ever known, Steve Roberts, uh, Sheila Penaluna is the only one there that's still alive that I know, Frank Wills was a planning engineer, John Lenning and Dick Swanner were the two best underground miners in the whole district then, and we were able to recruit them and a whole other team to do our development headings for our exploration. Uh, that's a cross cut between the Steward and the Belmont shaft. You probably know where the Belmont is out there towards where Montana Resources is. From that, we did fan drilling, and we defined uh, what uh, became uh, the, 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 the copper zoning and the magnetite zone in the, in the, the pre-mainstays before the Butte veins. That was really exciting, and we did it with quantitative mineralogy with uh, using micro microscopic identification of the minerals so that we could actually quantitatively show where the magnetite was, uh, what the molybdenum grade was from assays, and the fact that there was a lower grade copper core uh, to this ring going around that pre-main stage. That was a thrill to work on developing ore reserve for what was one third of the Butte district. When Chile nationalized the copper mines that impacted uh, the economics of the Anaconda Company, and Senator Mike Mansfield, who was the longest standing Senate Majority Leader in US history, had been a Butte miner as a young man, 
was worried about what would happen to the employment that the company was had previously had. And I was asked to go with Anaconda's president to give testimony to, to uh, Senator Mansfield's committee on the commitment the company had to develop this deep copper mold in a more body and to su support a workforce. And uh, uh, that was a thrill. This was, I met one of the great human beings I've ever met in my life. ARCO then came to town. They wanted the ACM reserves and uh, to get in the, the copper business. And my last job was presenting our reserves and our plan to continue exploration to the vice president for ARCO. And they, they didn't want to keep working underground the way the, the exploration geologists and, and copper do it. They wanted to drill holes from the surface. And, uh, uh, and it, it, it just struck me as not the greatest way to do that. And uh, they also shut down the pumps on the underground mines so we couldn't continue. And uh, out of the blue, uh, uh, I had an opportunity to move to Johns Hopkins, and I took it. And uh, uh, you know the rest, uh, you know, what happened to, to the deep underground here. These are the main uh, cities I've lived in after leaving Butte. And uh, uh, I've, I've, after Baltimore, I moved back to Berkeley when my mentor, Chuck Meyer, uh, uh, retired. And then I, after retiring, I'm back here. And now doing exploration uh, with a small startup. Uh, and the, 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 my travels, though, fortunately, took me in a lot of interesting places around the world. And so I, I really was lucky to have a, a career in, in, in exploration and research that uh, gave me a chance to, to, to work on, on most of the continents, excepting Antarctica. Antarctica. So after retiring, I started a, this company uh, called Clementine Exploration looking for copper and useful rare metals, uh, hopefully providing more employment for, for this area one day. Uh, getting now to our outreach, this perspective from civic engagement, this is Earthbook Montana. This is our website. And uh, we conduct this in the community hall in Wise River. And some of the people that, that come to that are here today. I suggest if you're interested, just type in that URL and uh, you can see what we do and what we're likely to be doing this coming summer. And uh, th the idea is that geology, to any of, any of us that make maps, is, is more than a piece of paper in two dimensions. It's a timescape. We see in there in the colors, ages of things. We see processes in there. All of this is invisible to people that think of that as a piece of paper. But uh, uh, the, the, the fact that that's a timescape, we can slowly uh, share with people by, by going through uh, certain elements of geology that they can learn to understand this with. It's done with four all-day narrative uh, hands-on sessions in the morning with field trips all afternoon. And the last day, we have volunteers from the audience put on their projects. And I'm stunned with what people come up with, you know, that uh, across the board, I mean, really innovative, uh, creative projects are, are put on. This is a picture from two years ago. This is Alton Miller, my colleague in it. Uh, uh, also, teachers can get up to 28 professional development units for participating in this. If they come less than four Saturdays, they get less than that. But they can get a substantial amount of professional development for free. Uh, Elise Lewis is right here. She, she is the most active participant. From the first day, her hand went up after about 30 seconds. And that told me this was not going to be a wasted exercise. I was going to have some serious dialogue. Uh, Diane Johnson uh, is probably teaching down at Central right now, but uh, she's a math teacher. Uh, uh, Quinn right here comes from Three Forks. Uh, actually worked with uh, Trent uh, McGill, two tech students working out in the field with us last summer. Uh, and so you, anybody interested, you're invited to join us next summer. The session, uh, the schedule will be posted on that URL. It's meeting with some success. Uh, Unbeknownst to me, we got sponsorship by Bud Light, <laughs> and uh, uh, I thought that's all right. You know, that <laughs> whoever wants to put up a free poster, I'm happy to have it. <laughs> uh, this actually started a long time ago in, in Beaverhead County. They've got a real program to try to beat down uh, 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 foreign weeds like knapweed that compete with grass, and it's really bad on the cattle. So they had me volunteer myself uh, in the uh, uh, silent auction the day of the, what they call the Weed Whackers Ball. 
And so I'd put on Geology Day for families that would, that would win that auction. And then it turned into Geology Day where I'd work with the, the school kids and the, 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 the rural schoolhouses there. Uh, Alta adds to the geology these wonderful uh, narratives of uh, historical perspectives of all of these places that we study geologically you know, from Bannock to Hecla to Quartz Hill, uh, wherever. And this is based on what people want to see. I send out a questionnaire to get feedback on what they want to do. And then Elton and I put a program together for them. Uh, with that said, let me just say that I think uh, because geologists haven't been doing enough to interface with the public, I think what we do is basically invisible. And uh, uh, how we make discoveries is unknown. Let me give you an example. If you've ever gone out with somebody who is a good birder, they're not out there with their binoculars like this. They're listening. They go by sound first, and then they know where to look. And the same thing with a surgeon. They just don't start cutting. They understand human anatomy and things that can go wrong or go right. And, and exploration is the same way. We understand a whole lot about the, the regional geology, and that's where we start. It's like the way we listen uh, the way a birder would to, to decide what we do. And this community outreach in that spirit is re really bi-directional. And we try to go beyond what a lot of companies call transparency, where they, they say, well, if we just have a meeting once in a while and the community is invited and we would like to drill here, do you have any questions? It, it, my approach is, is to give people a chance to learn enough geology so that if I tell them what we would like to do, they understand what it is, and, and they, they, have a, they have a reason why, why, why we, we think it's important. Uh, and they put, we can put mining in a scientific, historical, economic, environmental, and social context. In other words, kind of reassemble things so that when they look at it, they can make an informed judgment. And, and, uh, and what I find is people are quite interested to engage in that. And for example, I talk about what is an ore deposit and how they, when they form an integral part of nature, you know, as, as much as a piece of nature as any of us. Uh, I'm going to give a technical talk on our exploration program tomorrow morning in, uh, in the uh, Student Union building at 9 if any of you are interested in that. So please join in. Now, a big plug for the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. The centerpiece of our Earth Book Montana is a map that they produced uh, a few years ago, it's called the Roadmap of Montana. And what's really nice about it is they've simplified it into a much a narrower uh, table of contents, basically, on, on the different colors and things on here, uh, so that the public has a chance to learn what that means. And, and what I've done is take their map and add to it the places that we want to go to, like Argenta or Polaris, the Grasshopper Inn, and, and put our destinations on there, actually map the, the small scale roads on there with a GPS, and, uh, and then highlighted certain things that I talk about you know, when, we, when we, we have our narratives on Saturday morning. So that, that map is stunningly important. And that's a departure from a lot of surveys. You know, they, they do great publishing technical documents you know, that are research grade. We, we, that's vital to us you know, in exploration and, and doing science. But the, the public now has a tool put in their hand. I've actually seen this map for sale out at the truck stop, out at Rocker. You know, people can go in there and buy this map. Well, I buy bunches of these maps upstairs and sell them at cost at our class. But I just want to commend the, the Bureau of Mines for, for really putting out a, a useful uh, document like that. Um, so the idea is to make geology sort of come alive as a personal experience. Uh, with people actually being able to read and share geological maps. And some of the topics that I've covered are listed here, the age of these rocks, how we know how the Rocky Mountains form, what thrust faults are, the fact you've got to look at forces much bigger than what you see here to understand what's happening here. You've got to look at things the scale of tectonic plates. We look at geological hazards. We go to the Humboldt spires. Talk about mineral exploration, the Yellowstone Hotspot, Glacier Park, and the Chief Mountain Thrust. And uh, the first thing I found is after a couple of these Saturdays, I learned that somebody's gone up to Glacier Park, and they've gone and seen the Chief Mountain Thrust. And so people are getting out actually putting this, this, this class to use. So what I want to motivate is sort of a great American road trip with this Bureau of Mines map in hand and getting people out. To, just the way when, when we were kids, you'd listen to the radio, you had a common experience. And, uh, 
and, and you could then talk about what you heard. The map's the same way. If you could read that map and go somewhere, you've got a chance to do, do a road trip that's got some, some value to it. I do a lot with questionnaires, trying to get input is what people want to see. And I always ask for evaluations. And we take a lot of time to actually go through what people think of the, 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 the course. Uh, some examples of the hazards along the Big Hole River there and how uh, these, these perch rocks with cracks in them can turn into these kinds of slides. And uh, also in terms of broadening the frame of reference, just getting people to think of, if you look at a human today, uh, it's important to realize that a lot came before us. And uh, also, we know the ages now of a lot of these different life forms. This is going back to about 3.5 billion years. And at different times, there were mass extinctions. We talk about why we think those happened at different times. And uh, the idea is just to broaden this perspective, you know, to, to go beyond what we see right now into something that was back in time. And also to show them that geologists are the future, futurists now, that we can take our time machine and look ahead. Uh, the most durable fact I bring out is the age of the Earth, the four and a half billion year old age. I was lucky enough to do a sabbatical at Caltech one year with an office next to Claire Patterson, and I saw a truly uh, stunning good geochemist that, that contributed one of the, the most important uh, measurements that, that we've had in our science. It puts humans into perspective as latecomers on a, on a, on a stage of life, and if, if you realize that we're all made out of the same stardust, literally we're made out of stardust of all the stuff that came before us, that kind of connects you with all of this. And it connects you with everything that's yet to come. And uh, rather than humans having dominion and uh, I think a sense of wonder and knowledge of where earth materials come from that support our lives is a good companion to acceptance of some level of stewardship for what's happening now. It's a more complex understanding that that uh, I think a lot of us can aspire to. Uh, to understand the Rocky Mountains, let me give you another example. We have to consider very large pieces of the Earth. Uh, these are crustal plates, and now with really high-grade GPS systems, you can put them at different continents here, and relative to satellites going around, determine that some continents uh, are moving uh, in this direction, North America is moving that way, this oceanic plate's moving there, and you get a really good idea uh, at the, that little vector is, uh, is uh, 50 millimeters per year. Uh, you really see these continents are actively moving even though we're riding on them so we don't sense it. But that's a stunning realization compared to how we used to understand the Earth. Uh, these are called geodetic gray GPS measurements. Montana is drifting about 30 millimeters a year. That's about uh, 1.2 inches west-southwest. Uh, so you're sort of heading towards San Diego, basically. And uh, uh, it's important to, to realize that in terms of broadening perspective, uh, just imagine here now, if we look at Yellowstone Park here, it's thought that uh, the Yellowstone uh, hotspot broke out first down here near the southwest corner of, uh, of Idaho at Twin Falls. And that was about 17 million years ago. We can date those rocks radiometrically. And you might think, well, that hotspot just moved underneath the, the crust and is now under uh, Yellowstone at zero time. You'd be wrong because what actually happened was North America drifted that way over a fairly stationary hotspot. And this is uh, the type of rethinking that the Colleen uh, uh, Elliot's brainstorming with me about, could that be, for example, if having some effect on where the continental divide is? And that's something I've been trying to figure out, because every time I go to Wise River, I think of the continental divide and Butte going south, and all of a sudden I cross it when it goes west, and it goes way out to Idaho, and things like that just puzzle me, and I, I like to figure out if together we could figure out an answer to that. Uh, some other things we do is, is show people right in their backyard some, some pretty amazing things. In fact, if you go uh, west from Divide, go along the Big Hole, when you get to Dewey, there's a bar there called Thompson's Corner. If you look across the river, these are the rocks you see. You see the Pennsylvania Quadrant here, Permian Phosphoria, this black rock. This uh, sand, sand unit is the uh, Triassic Dinwoody. And, uh, uh, Right there is the greatest mass extinction that we know of in the history of the planet Earth. And that's right behind a local bar. So we're trying to change the conversation a little bit to broaden it, not, not 
deflect it, but get people thinking about something different. And we do that by hands-on work with just a few key rock types, sandstone, shale, limestone, and granite. And rather than teach them 30 kinds of igneous rocks, all we need to know is that rock was molten and it lost heat and crystallized. And uh, so what we do is look at geological time now coming up here in terms of uh, marine transgressions, regressions, where sea level goes from coming up as it inundates a continent to when it recedes. And what you, what you realize, you can look at three rock types, sandstone, shale, limestone, which is an offshore reef, and figure out there's been a whole bunch of these transgression regressions, and that uh, that's the norm. The Earth is constantly in, in these cycles and uh, that repeat. There's a great website called ck12.org. So if you're a teacher, there's incredible resources on there where you can get uh, really high quality graphics and text to go with it to incorporate that into K-12 science education for, for earth sciences as well as any other science. Uh, you can see now these units uh, we have a name for, the Flathead Sandstone hair going to Woolsey, Mar, Park, Pilgrim, Jefferson, Dolomite. I, when I was you know, in college, we just memorized stuff. And we we learned the fossils, so we knew their age. But now we know why they, they go from one lithology to another. In fact, it's that change that we now work out sea level change with. So it's it's a much more exciting time to be a geologist. Putting this together, we can look at uh, paleontology in a very active way. This is the number of families of species from 600 million years ago up to the present. These are. Uh, uh, ages, the trilobites are little things that look like crabs that are classic index fossils for the Cambrian. And then going up through time, the number of families occasionally would plummet. And those are mass extinctions. The one I mentioned is number three at the Permian-Triassic boundary where something like 95% of all marine organisms died off because of what we think were huge volcanic eruptions in Siberia poisoning the atmosphere that, that interacted with the oceans and these marine organisms died and a lot of land organisms died as well. Uh, we went from the age of reptiles here uh, to the modern fauna after the last extinction when a big bowhide hit the earth and the dinosaurs died and a whole new niche opened up and mammals filled that. And so you might say we wouldn't be humans were it not for the fact that dinosaurs are not chasing little mammals. In those days there were things about the size of a terrier dog. Uh, uh, okay, so I've also learned that these big ideas that I want to try to get in this, this Saturday program is you want to show them big pieces of time. So these names that we use, like Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, whatnot, are used to talk about big changes. And this is, in red, is a curve that Exxon geologists put together, led by Peter Vail years ago to describe changes in sea level relative to today. And this is major changes. This is plus 400 meters higher than it is today. There's 200 meters lower. And to correlate with those changes, things like glacial periods, you know, where if you get big polar ice caps, it takes water out of the ocean, so sea level goes down. And so uh, if we look at uh, cold and uh, warm periods based on oxygen isotopes in in uh, carbonates, which is another thing I talk about in the class, we can, we can look at temperature variations and uncertainties over time. And often when there's a big uh, drop in temperature, we get uh, glacial deposits. Uh, but that doesn't explain all the, the changes in sea level, which uh, also come from uh, uh, enormous eruptions of volcanic rocks on the seafloor when we have rapid seafloor spreading. So we, we actually try to add, add, add in the breakup of a supercontinent called Pangaea that, uh, that also changed sea level. Uh, we look at isotope records for the, uh, since the Cretaceous up to the present. It's been cooling off for the most part. So you think, well, boy, what is, it's not much the uh, global warming if it's been cooling. It's this long-term curve that gave us ice caps in here somewhere. Uh, what, what's, what's kind of interesting is we've seen a reversal of that. We've actually seen global warming uh, superimposed on a long cooling trend over a very short time span. Uh, this is uh, another thing we've looked at are changes in uh, uh, the, the orbital characteristics of the Earth in precession, obliquity, and eccentricity. 
And we think that's, uh, that, that's long been an interpretation of what uh, explains uh, uh, data from ice cores that go back to about 400,000 years in Antarctica, where we see CO2 variations in gas bubbles uh, correlating very nicely with these Milankovitch cycles. Uh, we can also look at temperature that's derived from those uh, and uh, uh, methane in green. Uh, and w w what's kind of interesting is to add to this long-term graph uh, current measurements on air, you know, in, in, uh, in Hawaii that show now we've gone above that, these peaks here. Now we've got up in the range of about 377 ppm. That was in 2004. Methane, this is on parts per billion, is higher, that's this green line here, than it's, than it's been in 400,000 years with, uh, uh, with about 1,800 parts per billion of methane. So uh, things have changed recently. And they, they, this is just the data. I'm not making an interpretation of it here. Uh, uh, I think uh, the one thing I want to point out is if we look at uh, uh, early, early uh, Homo sapiens uh, and people that coexisted with them, uh, early forms of, of humans lived through four ice ages in Europe. And if you, any of you ever done your 23andMe uh, genetic code, your genome, I'm almost 3% Neanderthal. And, uh, my wife's 2%, you know, and, and the, it turns out these weren't dumb organisms. Their brains were bigger than ours. Their brain case was 30% larger than modern Homo sapiens. And part of that, I think, was probably having figured out how to problem solve through three, uh, three or four ice ages. Uh, all right, uh, the Pew Research Center, and this is information that uh, Ed Rogers put me on to, is kind of interesting. It shows uh, what's interesting in terms of science topics for the public, and uh, a lot of people will read health and medicine, food and nutrition, some technology, but way down here at the bottom is evolution of humans and the animals. Like 2% of the people care about that. That's kind of amazing because that's not caring about who we are. It's just kind of assuming that humans were always the same. Well, any of us interested in geology know that we've evolved from other early hominids in, in uh, uh, so a lot of us, you know, find it kind of interesting that a lot of us carry around these genes from uh, from Neanderthals. There's even another group called Denisovans that uh, became the ancestors of the people who populated Australia. And uh, so, but it is kind of uh, interesting to me that there's so little interest in from whence we came as a as a species. Instead, people seem to live just in the moment, which is understandable when the economy's tough and everybody's in a survival mode. That's perfectly understandable. On the other hand, for 32 years of teaching at Berkeley, I had the good uh, uh, luck to teach several field courses every year. The first one uh, was for junior level geologists learning how to map and learn the California geology, but I'd get the paleobiology graduate students in that class who wanted to learn stratigraphy and mapping. And I learned a lot from them because a lot of them were working in Ethiopia and Kenya. And that got me interested in this whole thing about where we come from. And these are stunningly good young biologists. And uh, uh, they're working on some very fundamental questions about the origin of human species. Now, along with teaching biologists geology, we need to keep in mind geologists are timekeepers of the Earth. We can date things, and we can collaborate with anthropologists and, and help put the things they're interested in order and figure out how old they are. And biology led to the theory of evolution, partly because Darwin was a very good geologist, too. In fact, he had carried Charles Lyell's uh, uh, textbook on uh, principles of geology on the beagle, the voice of the beagle. And, uh, and now anthropology is, is leading just this year to why the human brain evolved. And I'll talk about some of the results of that. And uh, an example is, what were the social changes that drove human evolution? And just this year, uh, in Scientific American, there's a whole issue on this question about where did humans come from. If you go to our Earthbook uh, website, click on reading, uh, you can download some of these articles I'm going to talk about now. You can also buy the whole thing online from Scientific American, but that's a stunning issue that, uh, to me, is really a transformative piece of science. Uh, by the way, the fact that we have a reading, suggested reading on our website is Diane 
uh, it was Elisa's uh, suggestion in our class that, that during the winter time when we're not out in the field, people can share the kinds of things that, 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 uh, that they, they, they want to uh, suggest we read. Okay, well, this is kind of an interesting story. It has to do with climate change. In fact, if we go back to about 25 million years and look at grasses, there's a type of grass that makes a sugar with three, three carbon atoms. That's called a C3 grass, a C3 uh, 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 molecule. And that's typical of tropical sort of canopy. And that's, it, makes, uh, uh, it fixes carbon by the Calvin cycle. Uh, uh, but uh, right here, about 10 million years, a new type of grass developed. And instead of uh, Kenya and Ethiopia being kind of tropical, the savanna uh, environment started replacing that tropical jungle environment with, with a type of vegetation like grasses. Now corn is, is a C4 uh, a plant and rice is another one where the, you, you have four carbon sugars and right at about 10 million years there was a big transition in that part of Africa from tropical canopy to open savanna and it, with the formation of these C4 gases, the C4 uh, grasses and uh, uh, as that African climate changed at about 10 million years, early primates left the forest, apparently. This is all based on fossil evidence. Ventured out into the grasslands, but, you know, obviously just trying to survive. Really interesting happened. Anthropologists study something called dimorphism. If you look at a species like a gorilla, the males tend to be really big compared to the females. The males have big canine teeth. The reason is they're involved in ferocious dominance battles every day to be the dominant male that mates with a group of females. And uh, uh, over time, anthropologists noticed in early hominids that dimorphism disappeared. Today, humans are not dimorphic. Males and females are pretty much within standard deviation, the same size. Our canine teeth are kind of vestigial things. And what they think happened was very, very interesting. And if you want to read this, it's on our website. For the first time, somewhere in here, female hominids started choosing their mates. Rather than being you know, dominated by a male in the species, they could see in this, as the savanna, apparently, other males developing new strategies for survival, like using earth, earth materials like stone, people learning how to nap flint and make axe heads and arrowheads to survive in a new niche. And you notice when a new niche open up, opens up, biology just transforms itself. Just like when the dinosaurs died out with the bolide impact, mammals evolved like mad. Horses went from a little five-toed uh, species about the size of a terrier dog to equus because they weren't being predated or predated by great big dinosaurs and these great big reptiles. So this new grass niche apparently drove human evolution. Earth materials were used like stone, and this gene pool increased. And uh, uh, the selection process of females choosing uh, innovative mates, these anthropologists now think is what drove evolution beyond the great apes. That's pretty stunning to me. That's one year old. And so I think we're, if that's correct, uh, I think it's letting us uh, into a whole new uh, realm of, of, of understanding about who we are and where we came from. Uh, and I, I don't know if, if they have Sadie Hawkins dances anymore, but of my generation in high school, the first dance of the year, the girls asked the guys to dance. I think that's what drove human evolution. It's the choices women are making. Uh, Okay, so to, let me summarize this Earth Book Montana. Uh, besides straight geology, we have a lot of conversations like this with new research papers that are coming up. So the, the objective is to try to motivate a, a new great American road trip, but with a geological map, the Bureau of Mines map, uh, discerning scientific eyes and some pretty thought-provoking conversation. And uh, uh, so far, I'm optimistic. Let me turn now to the second perspective. This one's from higher education, which is something I've uh, done at Berkeley and Hopkins. And uh, this map here is uh, for a course I was asking Invent to satisfy what's called the American Cultures Requirement, the only requirement every undergrad has to take, whether they're in chemistry, college of engineering, or letters in science. And uh, they asked me to invent a course, and I chose to do it around uh, earth resources and society. And these icons represent different lectures. You'll notice some Montanans figure in here pretty importantly. That's uh, Mike Mansfield, uh, 
this is uh, Jeanette Rankin up there, uh, uh, Chief Joseph down here, uh, uh, red clouds up here. And it's basically a history of the West viewed through the window of Earth resources, mining law, Homestead Act. My ancestors were pioneers in uh, Arizona, they lived among the White Mountain Apaches. That's Geronimo up there who was a Chiricahua. And we look at things like population, uh, growth, uh, uh, John Wesley Powell, the second director of the USGS, basically looking at how the U.S. evolved uh, in response to uh, land being uh, removed from uh, the Native American uh, societies, basically. The Anglos uh, uh, took over that space, and uh, this whole idea of manifest destiny, you know, that sort of motivated the settlement of the West under the assumption of a principle called terra nullis, that the land was empty, but it wasn't empty. And uh, the Native Americans, you know, paid a huge price for the advances made by these Anglos uh, coming uh, to the West. Uh, so some lessons I've learned uh, in putting a class that to, like that together is if you build a, a class that's well designed and invite input from your colleagues in social sciences and humanities and try to teach challenging things, you get in stunningly bright students. And uh, they come in large numbers. That's the biggest class I taught for 10 years. And they're there to satisfy a requirement. And uh, uh, two of them were finalists for the Berkeley Medal, which is a, which is a, a real prize in, for undergraduates in a school with 36,000 people. Uh, these, the ones who make it to that level are pretty, pretty smart young kids. And if you think they'd be in physics or electrical engineering, computer science, math, or geology, they're in nutrition and art history. And, and, and to have students that can just knock your socks off with an intellectual argument come from a very different field is good for all of us in science and engineering. And, and that, that was a stunning, uh, stunning lesson for me. It's a good thing because I married an art history major. You know, not in my class, but 46 years ago, our honeymoon was moving to Butte. And my wife became the director of the Copper Village Art Museum in Anaconda. Uh, if we look at the impact of globalization today, we're all pretty aware of uh, a huge uh, shift here uh, in terms of manufacturing jobs. That's 20 million up here. Uh, outsourcing, automation, growth in tech hubs uh, drew people to certain places like Silicon Valley or biotech. And uh, they're built around the research universities and venture capital. And a lot of uh, uh, things happened in places that didn't have those. And there's been some growth in retail jobs, but at a, subsist a subsistence level. And that, the upshot of that is that we've got basically two Americas today. If you look at the Center for Disease Control site, the CDC, there's phenomenal maps in there that if you study them, you can learn all kinds of things. This is heart disease of white males. It's the only group that has a decreasing longevity in the United States. Now, why in this country with modern medicine should white guys my age be dying at a younger age. And, and, it, and it, it has to do with things like uh, smoking with bad ha health hab habits, nutrition, and things. And it's, and it's really sad. And it plays out into this map here, which is called America's Great Divide. And this, this spectrum here is called Distressed Communities Index. And these red colors over here are in the same places where there's heart disease, lowering longevity, and if, you, if you're lucky and you live in southwest Montana, you don't have that. But uh, you do out on the Crow Reservation. You've got it uh, in northern California. We've got it all over eastern Arizona. And we live in a, a country that's divided now. And, and we're really lucky if we're well-educated and we can get access to jobs that, uh, that pay enough to live on. But if you, if you don't, uh, you're living in a different state altogether. Uh, if we look at... The high-tech hubs like Silicon Valley, uh, we're seeing uh, 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 immigration uh, uh, filling slots for workers with specialty uh, uh, occupations. These are people that come in what's called an H-1B visa. This is a number of them. This is 120,000 here. And uh, they come from a host of different countries. India is the dominant one. And uh, you might ask, what's the U.S. doing wrong that we need to get these, these talented people from India? Another way to look at that is, what's India doing right? Why don't we have more people going into electrical engineering and computer science and, and filling these jobs? And 
uh, it's important to realize India is doing something right when they can turn out these, these young people that, that have those skills. If we look at the U.S. In, in a medical dimension, it ranks 31st in terms of medical graduates worldwide. And you think, you know, we are, we're inventing the state-of-the-art surgeries and pharma, pharmaceutical drugs and things, and yet uh, where doctors come from, you know, a lot of them come from outside the U.S. If we look at the percent of doctors with foreign degrees, uh, Montana doesn't have many people with foreign degrees, but if you look at Nevada, in, in some counties, 50% of the doctors come from another country because they couldn't find domestic doctors to fill those jobs. And, and so some of these states, as you go to New England, a lot of those are, are doctors trained in other countries. We need those doctors, so we, we, we need those immigrants. But why don't we have more people going into medical professions and science and, and all the related disciplines in biology? One key exception is the ascendancy of American women as nurses and as medical doctors, and that's helping to transform this profession in, in a, to me, a very positive way. One of my daughters is a neonatal intensive care nurse. Uh, uh, health is a growth industry as American ages, and the success of these targeted drugs that keep uh, you know, people in their 70s, you know, that it would otherwise die because of heart failure or, you know, uh, a, a stroke or all kinds of things. But what, what we should also acknowledge is that medicine and science are far ahead of society in the conversation about the impact of longevity. You know, I have a friend my age that's got uh, Alzheimer's. He's had it for the last two years. He doesn't know me anymore. I can, if I talk science, he'll smile, but... Uh, if somebody else talks to him, he has a blank look in his eye. So his wiring is still tuned in to stuff he loved, like science, but he doesn't know anything about fast trains or about the other issues in newspapers now. And uh, that, that, that's a tough dialogue to have. Okay, uh, a couple of things that really shook up the U.S. in my lifetime. In 1957, the USSR put Sputnik in Earth orbit. And that caused the first of two disruptive challenges to the U.S. and American education. And uh, I, 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 I rode that wave through school. It just transformed chemistry, biology, and earth sciences to be something that it wasn't before. And uh, uh, it, it transformed mathematics teaching as well. And we're now looking at another disruption. This was a, a, a report put out called Rising Above the Gathering Storm. Uh, about the impact of globalization, that our young people are competing against young people in India, China, Hong Kong that have an education which is you know, in some ways probably superior. And, and the question is, what can we do now to make sure our young people are going to be able to compete in this global marketplace? Uh, one measure of, of how we're doing is, is called the Program for International Student Assessment. It's called the PISA test. It's for 15-year-old uh, pupils in their performance in math, science, and reading. And uh, if I can spark up this, uh, this, uh, this uh, video, I'll try to give you an example. So just bear with me for a minute. I don't want to show you the whole thing. It's called uh, Waiting for Superman. Hey, my grandma, that part. Among 30 developed countries, we rank 25th in math and 21st in science. Almost every category we've fallen behind, except one. Kids from the USA rank number one in confidence. <laughs> About 60,000 people have gone to the school in 40 years. 40,000 didn't graduate. This is the damage. This Let me figure out how to turn this off here. <laughs> now, that obviously wasn't a Butte kid uh, because they can ride uh, motorbikes better than that. Let's see, where'd my link go to turn this off? There we go. The point of showing that was. Uh, uh, the U.S. ranks literally like 24th in, in some of these math and science fields. In, uh, whoops. What do they do here? Uh, 
and, it's, and it's partly because of globalization that companies could move their, their fa factories overseas. And a lot of the jobs that would have attracted kids to really work hard in school have moved somewhere else. And uh, uh, there was a response by the Governor's Association in 48 states that, uh, that became known as Common Core. And that was preparing American students for success. And mo most of our states are, are exercise that. And now we're going into uh, uh, next gen science, you know, which, which is a big deal to go from Common Core to yet a more challenging reference frame. And it partly grew out of uh, President Bush's No Child Left Behind Act, uh, but not so much focused on testing, but on learning. And it, it was part of the standard based education reform movement that. Uh, that I was lucky enough to participate in working with people, teachers in biology, chemistry, physics, uh, and earth sciences to, the, to make the requirements for what new teachers needed to know and give them tests so they could, they could prove proficiency in those things. Okay, uh, so there's, there's some worry about higher education now. Uh, let me turn uh, to the last thing I'm gonna talk about here is this perspective from earth resources. And uh, I, I picked up Engineering and Mining Journal a couple of months ago, and I just saw this thing. It says, Apple pledges to stop mining for iPhone materials. And I thought, what? You know, they, they, it's got half the periodic table in there. I love classrooms with periodic tables, by the way. And, uh, and, and so the question is, can recycling alone provide necessary materials? And I just, I, I just made a little diagram here of the periodic table putting red boxes around all the elements in an iPhone 6. And that's a miracle of chemistry, what's in here. And these are high purity things, sometimes seven nines pure, doped with different things to make uh, N and P junctions in, in the electronics. And uh, you might think, well, maybe we'll just get back the old phones, you know, take the stuff apart and refine them again. Uh, but globally, you, you can't do that because uh, there's an increasing population and there's an improvement in the global standing of living that requires new materials to be mined and in addition to recycling, which is an absolute imperative to not recycle is, 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 is unconscionable now. The demand for mineral commodities will continue to increase until the standard of living probably in less developed countries approaches the level of ones in industrial societies. So I think otherwise it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so, uh, if we look now at most of these elements here, most of them are imported from just a few countries, mainly from China. And uh, uh, if we look at copper, which is the underpinnings of all green high tech, this is uh, the copper in millions of tons since 1985, it's just increasing. And uh, uh, most of that is used in China now because they have this huge uh, population uh, that's becoming higher tech. It's, it's very wired electronically. Uh, and for electrical power, countries need copper wire. Uh, all right, so in closing, there's many important things to do, and we need everyone who's capable to jump in and the public to understand and support the role of these science, technology, engineering, and math courses that uh, shouldn't be taught at the exclusion of humanities and social sciences. Those are just as important. We need to blend those in some way so we have kind of a holistic education of people that can understand history, where we are now, and look forward and become problem solvers. And so my perspective as a grandfather with two daughters and three grandkids now is to just uh, suggest that, that we make a place for all our grandkids in the toolbox. And these are my three right there, two of them are girls and let them decide their future, not stereotypes. And I, I'm thrilled that more and more women are going into science and engineering and medicine because I think that's an essential part of how we, we, uh, we, we try to start to transform our country to make a much more healthier economy. Uh, so I'll end here with this slide. This is global population here up to the present. This is 10,000 years ago. You see the Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age on here, agriculture starting here. We're in the range of eight billion humans now. And uh, Earth resources is not just about extractive industries, which is sort of the term that's put on them, but it's about who we are as human beings whose choices like stone use, you know, back uh, 10, 10 million years ago, uh, 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 in, 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 in these new landscapes that were, that were uh, appearing in front of our hominid ancestors determined our intellect as a species, that 
these people out there are starting to use tools and the females who ch chose those mates over the gorillas in the woods is what basically made us who we are. And the earth resources were part of that. And it had to do with the use of these things that ended up being called the Stone Age. And finally, today the challenge in striving to meet the needs of a global population wakened by a sense of possibility, long-awaited ascendancy of women and the prospect of universal equity and peace you know, is something we could see. Uh, thank you for listening. from C3 sugars to C4 sugars? Uh, apparently, as the climate got warmer and it became much uh, more arid, the water necessary for the Calvin cycle uh, wasn't as abundant as it was. And when these, these uh, C4 plants developed and making carbons, three or four carbon sugars, that had an adaptive uh, advantage over the other ones. And uh, it's just like now we grow corn and rice, which are C4 plants, you know, uh, you can grow them in eastern Montana without a huge amount of water. You have to irrigate, but you can make very productive use of that land without having to be in a tropical forest. Uh, so the very efficient use of carbon, and that's carbon coming out of carbon dioxide. Lisa. Um, George, I was wondering, you know, when I was in um, engineering school in the 1970s, everything was pretty much lecture-based and just kind of memorized. And has, has teaching in universities changed? Is, is, is there a different way of, of teaching or, or learning? Uh, I think it depends a lot on the field. I think uh, it, chemistry always had laboratories. You know, a lot of us love those. In, uh, Geology, we've always had laboratories and microscopes, uh, field trips. Uh, uh, sociology is very field oriented now. And, uh, but you know, history, I think, is still taught with the podium and students. And I had, I had some great history courses in undergrad, but here's an, a counter example. When I started teaching that, that American cultures class, I'd take uh, six 12-seater vans on a field trip from Berkeley across the Sierra, I'd go to see glacial geology in Yosemite, go down Owens Valley to look at the water issues, you know, with the LA Aqueduct. I'd have some Shoshone friends come out and talk about their perspective on it. On the way, we'd drive by Manzanar, this Japanese internment camp. I started going in there, and just to bring that history into this class, and it's really interesting, out in this desert, you know, the history of that internment camp is sort of fossilized, but you can find concrete foundations, and you realize these Japanese families, a lot of them had been gardeners in LA, they made gardens out there. They were trying to make a, some beauty out of this desert situation, and there was a big obelisk there with Japanese characters on it, and me having a typical Berkeley class, there were some Japanese students, and I asked them to please read that and you just saw the value of diversity in a class then. Well, to me, I'm amazed that somebody could give a history class and talk about that but without going on a field trip. Because unless you experience it, there's no way you can get very deep into it. You know? and, uh, um, so I, I think pretty much a lot of things are still being done the same way. If, if you're lucky, you, if you take advantage of opportunities like that, the students really enjoy it. I, I get people who also as guest speakers who've been in an internment camp. Uh, you, you can actually tell by looking at this classroom that things have not changed very much. Look at the way it's set up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. pretty much like this. Is, this is not, right. how old is this building? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. well, the, the classroom I got to use for that class was kind of neat. It was. A, 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 a film theater, and it had, you know, hundreds of seats, but open spaces. And I, I got so I'd walk around the class the whole time, and so it wasn't like I was sitting behind a podium. I was talking to people, and they were engaging in a conversation. That I really liked. That was the best classroom I ever talked in, outside of a field trip where you're out there where the real science is. Huh? So Colleen. Is uh, they have basically four Caltechs. They call them Indian Institutes of Technology. And they get, out of this huge population, 
a winnowed group of young kids, you know, that are just stunningly good at mathematics and physics and just will work their tails off. And c they collaborate, you know, and, and uh, w one of the downsides of our education is we often have students compete against each other. They try to get on, you know, some, they want an A minus, so they got to get a 97 or something. A lot of these young engineers that come in from India, in particular, they're in and, and China too, they're used to collaborating. And so they'll do a problem set together. And a lot of American profs will say, no, that's cheating. To me, that's how science is done. You want, you know, like when I taught field camp out here in Wise River, I made people work in teams of at least two. And then every morning we'd, we'd get out in, 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 our, in our classroom and I'd plug in my tablet to the projector, show them my mapping for the day before. I'd pass that cable around to each team. They'd talk about what they each did and then we'd compile those maps once a week. So the whole thing is you together do something that collectively is much better, much bigger than just the sum of the parts. And uh, they love that because uh, they didn't view each other as competition. They viewed each other as collaborators, which is the way you work you know, in the real world. We get people out of like a major like molecular and cell biology because they hated that competition. And they realized in geology we were friends. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much does work ethic or the change in work ethic, say, in this country have to do with uh, standing in some of these international tests? That's a good question. A lot of people ask me that. I haven't seen any evidence of that, you know, but I think when we're in a very self-selected environment, you know, people competing to get into it. In fact, I really worry about the admissions process that we, we, when we don't take everybody who applies, how do we know that we got the right young person sitting in a seat? Because you got grades in high schools, well, over a state, those high schools are very different. So what the, they look at SAT scores. Well, I don't know what the SAT test really means. And so I really feel like it'd be better if for the first two years of school, people went to community colleges. And I, Montana Tech's doing a lot of things right, starting Highland, getting a nursing program. Those are really wise choices because I think those are in line with creating education in line with opportunities. And I think to continue to have really competitive seats in uh, research universities without making sure all those young people had two years of, of maturing before they go there so that half of them don't flunk out the first year, it would, would be better, you know. Now in California, our master plan builds in people failing because that makes room for the transfer students coming in from the community colleges. So that is kind of egalitarian, but puts a lot of emphasis on admissions. And I don't think we know how to do that very well. You know that in, in, in Quebec they have something called CEGEP, C-E-G-E-P, which is a two-year, you go at the end of 11th grade, go to a special, like a community college. Do you know that? No. Nope. Nope. So two, you spend two years in CEGEP, and then you move on to, to university after that. So it's like a like a prep school, like a like community college. Yep. But I don't know enough information. I don't know about their success rate. Yeah. Be interesting to. Uh, I can say from my own experience, I I was a carpenter working my way through my undergraduate years, and so I'd take night classes at, at a community college. Those students were every bit as bright as the ones at Berkeley, and. Uh, you know, I, I just assume we all have the first freshman, sophomore years at those schools and invest in them, you know, a lot more than the state does. Yeah? So, I'm impressed that you kept your opinion out of this entire presentation, but I'd like to ask you, I mean, every, every graph that we look at, ex extraction or use, it's all going vertical. How long do you think that would be sustained? Uh, you mean in terms of running out of stuff? Running out of stuff, overpopulating. Uh, the overpopulating part wor really worries me because uh, I think the planet has a certain carrying capacity. And uh, there's already, I've worked in Africa, North Africa, and boy, water resources are a real short shortage there. So I'm worried about that. Um, there are a lot of good things that are happening, like the Gates Foundation, you know, doing vaccination on a huge scale. That's really helping uh, families, I think, shrink in size because 
if you have a high infant mortality rate, the tendency is they have a bunch of kids, you know, and if you vaccinate them, a lot more of them grow to adulthood. That's a great thing. So, and the, the, the single biggest factor I've seen that's positive is in education of women. They tend to uh, have smaller families. The kids do better. Uh, the family's in a better economic situation. So that's a great investment to, that, that can help deal with, with some really dire straits, you know, with, with, with uh, societies aren't yet industrialized. Uh -huh. I guess what I'm asking is, do you think it can pull together to flatten it out, or do you think it's just going to continue to uh, The tendency is, uh, like Japan, I think, has a negative growth rate, I think, right now. Uh, I think in, we're, I think, aren't we going to re reach a replacement level here pretty soon in the U.S.? Uh, but how soon that all happens globally, I don't know. But we're, we're stressed for a lot of resources right now. Uh, we can still find new ones. You know, fracking is an example with hydrocarbons. But, you know, making source rocks into usable hydrocarbon uh, re reserves. But uh, water is another thing. You start mining the groundwater table by pumping the Central Valley of California is a disaster now. You drive down I-5, what used to be some of the most productive farmland in the United States is sitting there fallow because there's not enough water. And they pumped so much groundwater, they, they had subsidence and the buildings, foundations cracked, you know, and it's really, it's bad, you know. We should be desalinizing the seawater now for Los Angeles instead of pumping Sacramento River water down a great big aqueduct. Uh, you ask a great question. I, I don't have an answer. Uh, but dialogues like that, to me, I think are a good thing, you know, and we have a lot of them, you know, in our little Wise River Foundation hall there. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.